Right. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see so many faces on a Saturday morning. Um, hopefully, you're here for the knowledge as well as the food. So I am Phil Rogowski, founder of the Maryland STEM Festival. This is the eighth year of the Maryland STEM Festival. Each year, okay. each year we have a theme. This year our theme is cybersecurity and information technology, but not all our events tie into that, but that is a theme. But both of those fields do tie into this topic today. What we have been doing for the past five years is holding this event, which we call the Blue Collar STEM Conference. And what this event is about is Jobs require STEM expertise and STEM skills and STEM knowledge, but you can get them without going through the traditional four-year college path. So many people, when they say STEM, have a very limited view of STEM. They think of just um, engineers, um, high-grade computer researchers, and research in, in bio, biotech, but STEM is very, very broad. Um, from our standpoint, we include everything from astronomy to zoology. And there has been an emphasis on, and in, in some respects, maybe an overemphasis on trying to get everybody to a four year college. And the four year college is perfect for many people, and we need many people to do that. But there are other opportunities, there are other ways to make a good living with an interesting job, and that's what this conference is about. And many fields are desperately in need of people to fill these jobs, and these jobs are paying very, very well. These range in manufacturing, IT, and cybersecurity has jobs in the blue collar step. Um, construction and um, maintenance, a lot of fields have very high paying jobs, but you do need some step knowledge, you need some background, you have to have some understanding of how things work. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, we have been doing this job at different community colleges because the community colleges are a great way to get these um, jobs, to get the resource, to get the skills to roll into one of these positions. So after the opening, we're going to have a panel discussion with some representatives from the fields that are looking for these type of workers. And then CCB, CCBC is going to be showing off their great facilities that enable people to get some of the skills to go into some of these jobs. So you're in for a great day. CCBC has gone all out to put on a great event, including feeding you. So again, please, um, we don't want any leftover food, so make sure you get the food. I am now going to turn the program over to Dr. Joaquin Martinez, who is the provost here at CCBC, to welcome you and have a few opening remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. Welcome to CCBC. Uh, I know it works because it's Saturday morning and, and look at all these winners here. Uh, and I know there, there are some mom and dads uh, and teachers who are also here. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you officially to Community College of Baltimore County. I'm the provost uh, at CCBC, which means everyone tells me what to do and I go and do it. And so uh, I'm, I'm really uh, very thrilled to see you uh, exploring um, these opportunities. At CCBC, um, we have a little motto under our title. And, and very often I say, um, discover CCBC, right? The incredible value of education. Uh, and so that's, that's what you're here to do. I encourage you um, to discover uh, this institution. What a phenomenal place where uh, just about 50,000 students uh, from all walks of life find some extraordinary opportunities. Uh, I wanna thank a lot of the folks behind the scenes who work very hard um, to bring you here today. And I know that our president, uh, Dr. Kornitis, is delighted to have you on board. How many of you have already taken some classes or been a student at CCBC before? Raise your hand, quick show of hands. Very nice, wonderful. And so there are seven CCBC campuses and sites across Baltimore County. This morning, I wanna talk very briefly about two very special things that are happening uh, at CCBC that I, I, I want you to know about. Uh, for those of you who are already affiliated with Baltimore County Public Schools, you may have heard us talk about uh, the blueprint, the Maryland blueprint. What that means is that the taxpayers have uh, understood the, the amazing contributions that you all can make to the economy and the workforce in our region. And so they've agreed to open 
the totality of the curriculum, continuing education, credit offerings across uh, of just about over 200 programs of study for high school students in Baltimore County Public Schools to enroll or co-enroll at the same time in high school and in college. Now I know I have mom and dad's attention because imagine this, imagine you are invited to that high school graduation for your uh, son and daughter to uh, accept the high school diploma and they have already received from us their college associate's degree. So they will graduate from college before they ever even have access to that high school diploma. That becomes available to every single Baltimore County student. And the best thing about it is at no cost. And so if you're interested in exploring any of these programs, I encourage you and any of our folks here can connect you or your families or your teachers um, to our early college access programs because all of the curriculum can help you meet both high school and college requirements at the same time. I'm going to take that just one step further. CCBC is launching a program that we call Degrees to Succeed. Many of you have already identified a target four-year institution. How many of you think in the room that at some point you may be interested in pursuing a bachelor's degree, a baccalaureate, right? Many of you. And so Degrees to Succeed works this way. We've partnered with many, many institutions in Baltimore County and in Maryland. Think Towson University, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, UVault, uh, Coppin, uh, uh, and beyond CCBC and Maryland, Southern New Hampshire University, APUS, UNGC. And these institutions will meet you well before you ever even set foot on campus. And they will make a commitment to you. If you pursue a CCBC degree and you complete your Associate of Arts or Associate of Science degree at CCBC, and you meet some key criteria, not too many, both institutions will make a commitment to admitting you. It's our dual admissions program. Both institutions will make a commitment to admitting you all the way to your baccalaureate and they will have a significant amount of support uh, scholarship monies assistance with dual counseling so you have bridge advisors that are working with you here at ccbc from our four-year partner institutions put those two things together and our high school students can finish their degree their high school diploma and their bachelor's degree by the age of 20. And that might even mean for a significant uh, amount of uh, money savings for that four year degree. So I encourage you to remain connected. Um, I wanna welcome Dr. McCrary to CCBC. Thank you very much um, for uh, sharing your time with you this morning. Uh, Mr. Rogowski, thank you for bringing your program to CCBC. And that once again, I look forward to seeing you on campus soon. Thank you, Dr. Martinez. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. McCurry, I want to build upon a point that uh, Dr. Martinez mentioned. And that is the blue collar STEM concept we've developed, a critical element is continual learning. So many of you hopefully will go into some of these jobs, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't go further you're good. Whatever job you go into in this area, you're still going to need to keep learning. And some of that learning could lead to further degrees, um, which frequently your employer will pay for. So again, the most important concept we like to stress in Blue Collar STEM is continual learning. You'll start somewhere, but unfortunately the world is not where it was 50 years ago, where you could do something, you never have to learn any new skills, new, not gain any new knowledge. Um, whatever job if you enter the blue collar STEM world, you'll still need to keep learning. And this concept of blue collar STEM really came from the gentleman I'm gonna be turning it over to in a moment. Um, Dr. Victor McCrary is on the National Science Board and he is vice president at um, UDC. He has 
Um, spent time also at Morgan State, one of Maryland's great institutions. Um, he came to me a couple years ago and said, Phil, I have this great idea. We have all these great STEM jobs that need to be filled that provide a great standard of living, but people just don't know about it. So why don't we use the festival to help make increase awareness of these jobs? And so I said, it makes perfect sense. Um, I am all for engaging everybody in the STEM community and trying to get everybody to a successful economic life existence. So we started this program about five years ago. Um, we want to continue, we hope to keep growing and we hope we're doing some good, we're getting the word out, especially to parents. Um, because part of the problem again is the overemphasis and sometimes the emphasis only on the four-year college path, which again is one of many great paths, this being another one. So parents, I'm glad you're here gaining the um, knowledge, becoming aware of this, hopefully you'll share this with other parents and the counselors at your kids' school because this is an idea that needs to be expanded upon and needs to be brought out. But as I said, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Victor McCrary from the National Science Board to say a few words to welcome you and talk about his perspective on this, this area. So Dr. McCrary? Yes, uh, thank you, Phil Rogowski. I appreciate it and I appreciate your friendship over this past five or six years. Uh, and the provost, thank you again. And also parents and, uh, and students. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. All right, come on. I know you all have, you hadn't had your coffee. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, all right. So what I've come to tell you today is, and I want parents really to listen to this, that right now we are in a Sputnik II moment. Okay, now some of you all may have heard the history of Sputnik and Sputnik 1. I can tell you today, I am here today, I was one of the people around when Sputnik was flown. That was a satellite that the Soviet Union had put up. It scared America because it thought that we were technologically behind. And at that time, the National Defense Authorization Act, so this is 1957, put hundreds of millions of dollars in the schools, both in the high school, the middle schools, uh, to learn trades, to learn new math, to learn science. I got into science because of that. Well, right now we're at a Sputnik II moment. Um, as uh, Mr. Rogowski said, uh, I'm the vice chair of the National Science Board, which oversees the National Science Foundation, and we advise the president on science. And I talked to his science advisor about a month ago, just to give you my background. Um, I'm, I have twofold. And this is for parents and students. So I'm the vice president for research at the University of the District of Columbia. And I'm really concerned about students getting out and getting jobs. But also, as the vice chair of the National Science Board, I'm worried about the science in this country and how we're going to move forward. And when I talked, you know, in 2016, I was appointed by President Obama and reappointed this year by President Biden. When talking to his science advisor, Francis Collins, just a month ago, he said that we do not have enough people going into these blue collar STEM positions. These are plumbers, these are electricians, these are IT specialists, these are health specialists. But just to tell you all, and this is to you parents, these jobs are not your daddy's or your mom's electrician. When I was recently up in Detroit, I know all of you all have heard about electric cars and autonomous vehicles, and in about five years, a car will just pick us up, we can just sit back, it'll take us to where we want. But when I asked the people in Detroit what kind of workers they're looking for, they said, we need a million workers in the next five years. They're going to pay good salaries, anywhere between sixty dollars to $100,000. But the kind of people we need are not the people who came on the auto plants in the 1920s, where all you needed was a strong back and a good alarm clock. What we need is people who know how to code, people who know a little bit about electronics, because as we all know, Cars are no longer just mechanical systems, they're electromechanical systems. Um, and people who know a little bit about circuit di uh, diagrams and materials. I mean, all of you all in your parents' cars, if you're driving yet, you know, you have to sync it with Bluetooth. But in the future, we're talking about vehicle to vehicle communications. But one thing they did say in Detroit, and this was just uh, a couple of years ago when we were there, these people don't need a bachelor's degree and they can start at good, at, make good salaries. So I'm telling you right now, you all are at a cusp because as Mr. Rogowski said, there are multiple paths to a good living or, or to the middle class. Um, I'm wearing the shirt of the Army, U.S. Army Transportation. 
My father was a blue collar stem guy. He was at Fort Eustis. He joined the service. He learned how to uh, navigate boats and chart planes. He had to learn signs and cosines. He had to learn trigonometric tables. But he didn't have a bachelor's degree and then ended, ended up working in the service for 29 years and had a good job. There are many jobs that are available right now to you all. Uh, and we need you. I would say Uncle Sam needs you right now because we are in global competition. Things like AI, machine learning, quantum, uh, and 5G are extremely important. And if those terms sound like something that is extremely scientific to you, they are, but the workers who are in there don't necessarily need a four year degree. And so five years ago, uh, Phil and I got together and we said, look, there are all these opportunities. And also there are a lot of students who are trying to figure out where should they go. And the uh, price of college is extremely high. And so we started this thing to talk about the availability of jobs, to also really reach out to you parents, because I do know when I grew up, I'm probably as old as some of you, um, if there was a certain prestige about having a college education, and there was a certain stigma, stigma, a negative stigma, if you didn't have it. Well, that's all going away right now. Um, I can tell you right now at the University of District of Columbia, we have an aviation maintenance program where I can take a young woman or a young man out of high school who doesn't know anything difference between a Phillips head screwdriver and a regular head screwdriver. And in two years, they get an FAA certificate uh, and they can go out and work for Southwest or American Airlines starting at 70 to $75,000 a year. Now, as Mr. Rogowski did say, that's not the end because if I take that young man or woman after five years and they show good work ethic, okay, and you know, show that they know what they're doing. As an employer, I would come to them and say, hey, look, uh, maybe you ought to go back to school a bit and uh, we'll pay you your bachelor's in aerospace or mechanical engineering. Well, wow, now you get a college degree, but you don't have to pay for it. And then maybe five years later, I say, hey, Vic, um, I don't want you uh, up here working on aviation engines, but I want you to run our business. So I want you to take some courses in cost estimation, and I'll take some courses in project management, okay? And so you get some certifications, uh, but then of course your employer pays for it. So my son, for example, uh, he's in the Coast Guard, uh, doing very well. He has a lot of his friends who went out and got college degrees. Unfortunately, uh, they have about $100,000 of debt and they're working at Chipotle. So I'm just saying, I'm not down in college. As you know, he called me Dr. McCrary. I, I did go to college, but there are multiple paths. And I want you to consider today from this conference the multiple fields that you can go in um, and build on your credentials such that whether you want to work, for example, as a mechanic, electrician, even places in the federal government are looking for cyber folks that don't need a two-year degree. But if you know how to use a Microsoft Xbox controller, we're looking for you. And the government yeah. is looking for So I will say, tell you right now, um, please take advantage of all the exhibitors and information you have there. Parents, please listen. And I will offer up if you talk to Mr. Rogowski during this conference today. Um, give him, he can give you my contact information. There are tons of programs and internships offered by the government, particularly the Department of Defense, that are looking for people. There are good jobs out there for you. And also, when you're working with these employers, if you want to get add credentials or micro certifications or even a degree, they'll pay for you. Right now, Uncle Sam needs you. It's a good time to get into one of these uh, uh, trades or what we call career technical education. And I hope you come forward and do that because not only will it provide a good career pathway, there's neat technologies coming out, particularly with climate change, people who are going to be installing solar panels. Those are all electricians. It's really good work, great opportunity. And if you're interested, please get in touch with me because you can have a bright future going ahead. Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Dr. McCrary. Um, I actually want to build on something Dr. McCrary said and kind of plug an event we have coming up on Thursday. We are having an event on Thursday in Baltimore City. I think there may be some flyers you can find on our website called Bridging the Digital Divide. Um, 
It may not apply to anyone here, but there are a number, many people in this area who don't have really good access to the internet. And we are doing a program on that this Thursday it's at um, 7 p.m. And that is an area that will need a lot of blue collar STEM jobs. The telecommunication industry has a lot of opportunity for blue collar workers, and you can help solve this problem of enabling everybody to have equal access to the internet and the world wide web and the cyber world. So think about um, coming to that program on Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, so did you want to drop off, Dr. Perry, or do you want to hang on for the panel discussion? I, I just want to say, I'm going to jump off and say thank you to everybody. But I also want to say in our region, I live in uh, Columbia, bg and &E, uh, uh, Northrop Grumman, they have plenty of these jobs. Um, I met with the VP for IBM. 60% of the people they have, and that's a high tech company, do not have college degrees, but they're in good paying STEM jobs. So again, I urge you to take advantage of all of the things you'll see today. And if you want more, more information, reach out to Mr. Rogowski, who will give you either my information, contact information, or others. But for parents and everything like that, no one should have to pay for a college education or any education if you go to do college STEM. Okay, thank you, Dr. McCurry. We'll talk to you soon. All right, thank you. All right, so now the part of the program where we bring in some employers and some people who are actually currently working in the field to talk about the jobs that they have in their organizations that need these blue collar STEM workers. So I'd like to invite our panel to come up and we'll be introducing them and talking about uh, the positions that they have and what usually have many openings. So. So I'm going to pass the mic down and ask each person to introduce themselves, give us their title and the organization they work for. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Sedina. I work for uh, Jane Adams Resource Corporation. My, my title is on the director of manufacturing operations. My background is on uh, machining, and, uh, and, uh, which is a great opportunity to be here. What we do, we provide uh, training for welders and, and machinists, and I will talk about what that entails later. Good morning. My name is Phil Tolkoff. I'm president of Tolkoff Food Products. We're a manufacturer of condiment sauces and dressings located in Baltimore City. I'm Kim Quinney. I'm the business manager for the Bureau of Utility Operations for Anne Arundel County. Um, we operate water and wastewater treatment plants, among other things. Good morning, I'm Scott Harding. I'm the CEO of FB Harding Electrical Contractors. We're located in Frederick, Maryland. Good morning, my name is Ben Herkus. I'm here with the uh, Heffron Company. I'm general foreman for them. We do um, biotech and healthcare, uh, plumbing and mechanical work. Thank you. As you can see, we have a diverse group here who is involved in manufacturing and um, public works and biotech. And so I'd like each um, of our panelists to talk about one or two jobs in their organization that fits into the blue collar field. Of course, the title job and, and a little bit about what these jobs, the workers who are in them do. So I'll start with. <coughs> we do plumbing and mechanical specifically. So my two main trades are plumbers and steam fitters. The plumbers that we have do um, all of your normal plumbing systems that you can imagine from water, waste, lab gases, that kind of things. My steam fitters do larger scale stuff like boilers and chillers and all that. But basically we're in charge of the heartbeat of the buildings, um, the labs, the healthcare facilities that we do. Um, we make sure that you know you have clean water to drink and that you can turn your air conditioner or your heat on when, you, when the seasons change. All right, thanks. We're commercial electricians, so pretty much everything we do today uses electricity. Charge your phones, lights up here, powers up the equipment that Ben's team does in order to have heat, air conditioning, all those things. So we have a, a couple of different types of electricians on our team. We have some that do like fire alarm systems. We have some that do a lot of lighting, do power distribution. So there's, and we have some that do all. So there's a lot of different opportunities within the electrical trade. The other job I would mention, which uh, also is one that isn't thought about a lot, is if you're a computer geek kind of person, we also have virtual construction. So we have people who 
work to design the models for the buildings that we build off of today. We don't just build off blueprints anymore. As a matter of fact, we don't use them a lot. Mostly in the field, we use iPads and things of that nature for our drawings. So we also have people who do the models, build the drawings to do that kind of thing. So it, it's really important. And I always recommend that, um, and, and Dr. McCurry mentioned this, and, and Phil mentioned this, if you're mechanically inclined, if you're a person who's mechanically inclined, and someone's trying to encourage you to go get some job where you're going to spend the next 50 years of your life in a seven by seven cubicle, that's a nightmare. If you're really mechanically inclined, look to get into the trades, whether it's mechanical, electrical, you know, there, there's great opportunities there for you when you get to build stuff and take pride in doing that. So in utility operations, we have everything from IT, GIS, mechanics, electricians, instrumentation techs, um, but one of our biggest needs is water and wastewater operators. These are the people who operate the plants that create your clean drinking water um, and treat the sewer so that it goes back clean into the environment. Um, and those are some really, really good jobs that we, we have about 25% of our staff is eligible to retire in the next five years. So there's definitely a need, not just in Anne Arundel County, but every jurisdiction in the area is going to have these types of jobs available. Uh, so I mentioned we make uh, condiments, sauces, and dressings. You probably, most people probably haven't heard of Tolkoff food products, but how many people have eaten at Panda Express, Shake Shack, Outback, Applebee's? You've eaten our food without knowing it. We're making a lot of things that are in the back of the kitchen. So for us, we have big industrial kitchens. We have equipment that's uh, doing mixing and chilling and blending, cooking, uh, filling machines, cappers. We have robotics. We have robotic palletizing. We have robotic case mapping. Uh, we're looking for industrial mechanics, people that are good with their hands, just like Scott was saying, that want to weld, build things, program robots, um, repair equipment, improve equipment, improve processes. Uh, so you know, if you're the kind of person that likes to take your car apart and put it back together, that's where we what we want. We help with the training, with the, the different uh, skill sets, uh, programming, right? PLC programming, things like that. So it's a little bit of everything. Uh, very hard to find those folks. Probably starts anywhere from twenty bucks an hour entry to uh, forty some dollars an hour at the uh, at the upper end. Um, my lead engineering and maintenance uh, manager started as my part time parts clerk. Uh, and now makes well over $100,000 a year. 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 So I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Again, I'm, I'm from Jane Allen. We're a nonprofit. And we train up because there's such a, a skills gap for machinists <coughs> and welders. Everything you see on the roads and the planes, medical equipment, everything in here. Of the machinist has had their hands on it, have made the equipment, the stamping tool, or whatever. So there's a great demand for welders and uh, CNC machinists. What is a CNC machinist? Well, if anybody likes to work with their hands and they like to be creative and they like to see something they made from a piece of raw metal into an intricate part that may go into a, a space shuttle, it may go into a defense missile, it may go into a, the electric cars. Uh, machining may be the job for you. It's a job that has a lot of overtime, a lot of advancement. You can start out as a CNC machinist and do programming. You're working in air conditioning. You're challenged every day. It's a it's a great atmosphere, you know. And also welding. You know, I I manage shops that have big fabrication weldings that build, build trenches and bridges. And right now, there's such a great demand for welders. On the East Coast alone, there's a five billion Dollar grant has five million to build offshore wind. It's a 15 year project, and they're going to need many, many mach machinists, and they're going to need many, many welders and fabricators. And that's just one opportunity that's going to be, it's a 15 year project, and right now we're being asked for to get geared up to train welders already. So it's a, it's a great trade, and there's a lot of room for advancement. You can move into engineering, you can move into uh, project management, uh, management, supervision, and it's a kind of a trade. If you become a machinist, you don't learn it one day. It, it may take four years, but while you're learning, you're getting paid. Entry-level positions, 
range anywhere from 20 to 25 dollars an hour. And once you're in, in the trade, CNC machinists make anywhere from 35 to 50 with a lot of overtime. So it's something to check out. Well, CNC stands for Computerized Numerical Control. So you program the machine to do the work, you know, and you, you work to very, very tight tolerances, and it's very exciting. You know, it's a growing career. And the same thing with welders. Um, I'd like to talk about something that Dr. McCrary broke up, uh, brought up. Um, frequently, people today have a con when say blue collar, people think of dangerous, dirty, grungy jobs in a facility that's not necessarily safe. A lot of that is involved. A lot of this came from books that some of us probably read in school called Jungle. Um, so I'd like. I'd like everyone to please talk a little about the work environment of your blue collar STEM workers. We work on construction sites, which, um, as a history, have been thought of that way exactly, 100%. Um, we also maintain things in boiler rooms and all, which can be like that, but construction sites have come a long way in the past. Even I've been in the trade 16 years now, and in that 16 years, from the quality of the work, the level of the safety, the upkeep, just the day-to-day -day operations in the construction site have changed to the point where it's not, it's not this big nasty muddy mess hole in the ground anymore you know we were expected to keep our stuff at a level that you know would rival normal normal work operations in anywhere you know once once things are out of the ground um, so the idea of just it being you know this dirty construction worker is is long gone out the window um, you know and we have guys that work in hospitals and facilities like that that are inside a building like this all day you know, we maintain things. We make sure that the operations in the hospital or the medical facility, the biotech facility, all can stay up and running. And you know, they they dress like I'm dressed now. And you know, we're here to fix things if need be. And if not, they have air conditioning, you know, heating. We even have a couple of campuses where the guys get to eat lunch for free and all that kind of stuff. So there's, you know, the idea of just being a dirty construction worker is something that just needs to kind of wash away. Yeah, I echo what Ben said. He said it really well. Um, you know, some of the facilities we work in, because they are the biotech facilities, they're cleaner than this room here. And you have to have all clean tools to go in. It, it's a very uh, clean environment. But there's part of the excitement of building a building is starting it from the ground up. I mean, if you're out there early on when it is just, just a flat surface on the earth and getting to be a part of taking it all the way, finishing it up to it looks really pretty on the inside, that's part of the excitement of the job. So uh, some days it's hot, some days it's cold, but uh, you know it's not sitting behind a desk all day. And that, that's part of the excitement of the job. And on the safety side, I really want to echo that as well. Is we're in a much safer environment. There's, It's very different from when I was in the trade a million years ago uh, when I got started. So uh, the emphasis on safety, it's really, really important. And, and I would venture to say a lot of construction sites are safer than a lot of other places because there's so much emphasis on safety today. So I probably have the fun one of this one, having wastewater treatment. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you probably have in your mind what wastewater treatment would be like, um, but you do have plants that are in some you know, where you have facilities that are indoors um, with machinery and Whole bunch of stuff it's generally really clean inside of there i can't tell you that it doesn't smell because that definitely um, does happen and there are some pretty gross things that you come out of there so sometimes we may have a pump that's backed up because people have put things down the sewer that they shouldn't like wipes and floss and grease and that kind of stuff so there could be some dirty aspects to that job um but for the most part it's you know, it's indoors, it's outdoors. You get a variety of things. You're not doing the same thing generally every day, um, depending on you know conditions that are that are going on there. But it's a safe environment. It's it's a good good place to be. So you got to realize we're all in competition to try to get you guys. So mine is much better than any of those. Okay? <laughs> you're not working outside. It's not hot one day and cold the next. Um, you know. We're a food manufacturer, right? So you talk about cleanliness, food safety, quality. Um, people that work on the factory floor, we provide uniforms that they have to wear. We have a captured shoe policy. You can't wear your outside shoes inside. Uh, the production areas are all air conditioned and heated. Um, warehouses are not, and then we have refrigerated and frozen facilities. But 
Um, the stereotype about manufacturing, especially in Baltimore, is things like Bethlehem Steel, where it was hot and dangerous and, uh, and dirty. Uh, food manufacturing in particular is not like that, can't be like that, and you can't stay in business. Uh, so it is a much cleaner environment and uh, temperature control. And that goes with the CNC machining. Uh, again, it's nice air conditioned. There has to be air conditioning plus the machines have to run in room control. So there, there you go. Air conditioned, you have a good work environment. There's breaks, there's lunch times, there's a lot of advancement. And for welding, there's two types of welding. There's if you like to be outside and do some really neat stuff like build bridges and construction. Uh, being a, a welder is a, is a great opportunity. Again, the safety and the dirtiness of it, as described by some of our panelists, it, it's true. But well, safety is a big thing in manufacturing, especially in machining, especially in welding. So the environments are good, the pay is good, there's desperate need. I work on the job development side, and, and companies contact me, they need machinists, they need welders. I'm talking good companies like Constellation Energy. Uh, we, we place somebody started at 35 an hour with great benefits. Uh, we have command technology, they need CNC machinists, former fabrication, they need welders, they contact us and we try to supply certified welders and machinists. But there's a lot of opportunities to learn machining and, and welding in all the areas besides the nonprofit like our own. So, so um, I'd like everybody, I mean, there's been some can start. Um, we've touched a bit upon what is very important to most people is the salary, the pay. So like each person talk about the starting salary again, you know, where you can go, and then also what type of, how you get your first job with your organization, what skills you need, how you go about it. Well, a great way to become a, a, a machinist is that a lot of companies offer apprenticeship programs where you start and they train you. That's where I started. I started as a tool and die apprenticeship and I moved off to manufacturing engineering, management, supervision. But um, there's also schools out there like Lincoln Welding, uh, Earl Beck, so they'll teach you to become a welder, you get a certification. Once you get that cert, then you go to companies and you start as an entry level. And that's when, for example, we placed somebody who came out of a homeless shelter and he's still living there. He's been sober for, for eight months. He got a job in Baltimore Fabrication. He's got three raises already, and now he's a lead person. And that's within the last six months. So there's great opportunity for anybody. And when I talk to people out there, they want some people that want to learn. They want people to show up one time and be dependable. And if they, have, if they want to learn, the world's open to you because companies need desperately technical people, machinists and welders. You know, to make their deadlines. And with offshore wind, electric motor industry, my last 15 years before I took this job was all making electric motor laminations. You know, and, and that's gonna and that's gonna grow very big and they're gonna need CNC machinists. Uh, talk a bit about the salary and the hourly rate. Oh uh, the sa salary and hourly rate, you know, entry level, you know, anywhere from twenty to twenty five an hour, and there's always gonna be six month raises. And you're going to move up, and once once a company sees you're doing some really great work, they're going to move you on to tougher things, and the salary goes up. So it's nothing for a, a good good machinist or welder to make close to six figures. You know, and that's just the way it is. You know, there's desperate need. It's a great job, and not not enough people know about it that it's out there. And the good thing is, these companies you go to, they will pay for your college. I went back to college; it was all paid for. You know, I, I was taking courses and unrelated to work, and we were still paying for it. So, and there's a lot of, once you get in as a CNC machine, I keep saying CNC machinists, but machinists as in general, there's great ways to move the different parts, quality, uh, purchasing, and things like that, that can lead to more money, especially when you get to management. You know, if you move up to Manufacturing engineering anywhere from 150 to 200,000 for, for a lot of these big companies that test for the need, like Boeing or General Motors. So, uh, we have a certified uh, apprenticeship program through the state of Maryland, and uh, ours is not time based. So, there's a lot of apprentice programs where you have to be in for two years or three years or five years. 
Uh, ours is skills based, so there's different skills that you have to uh, accomplish, uh, and then you work on to the next one, the next one. So it's really uh, a matter of how uh, hard you want to work and how quickly you pick up on things. We're about twenty dollars an hour at a at a starting point, uh, and I don't want to get completely uh, held up on mechanics. Uh, that is definitely one of the areas we need. But there's lots of jobs in manufacturing that are not like on the production floor, right? There's there's scheduling and purchasing and logistics and shipping and receiving. So you know, even if you're just good at math and good at problem solving, uh, scheduling, you know, being able to figure out what fits in and uh, how fast it goes through the equipment and how many cases you need and being able to um, uh, trade different things off because I got to get. I can't run this when I'm running that. So there's a, there's a lot of almost like a puzzle or problem solving to it. So once again, I don't want to get caught up on mechanics. There's lots of jobs in offices in manufacturing uh, that are really, um, uh, that are good jobs. You are at a desk, uh, but there's a lot of running around. You're always going down the plant floor and talking to people and stuff like that. So for our flex worker program, which is a lot of our jobs that are um, don't require college degrees. The starting salary currently is nineteen forty six an hour. Um, that goes up in January, um, and the max is about forty four dollars an hour. But there's also overtime, as been mentioned by some of the other panelists here. Uh, we do have a career ladder, though, as part of that program. So as you learn skills and you test, you get a pay increase. So it's not you know every six months or every year. It's it's based on your progression in the program and the more skills you learn the more money you make um, we also do will pay for college um, and training a lot of the jobs that we have require high school diploma and then some experience in either mechanical electrical or plant operations um, there are some that are entry level that wouldn't require that um, but it varies based on which jobs you're looking at um, I would say you would also need to have a good knowledge of math, biology, and chemistry. So to become an electrician, it is a four-year apprenticeship program. Uh, you work and you go to uh, school at the same time. That's to help you get better and learn all aspects of the trade, which is really good. When it comes to compensation, uh, I always encourage people to think total compensation and not just hourly rate because benefits are a big deal. Whether it's your health care benefits, your retirement benefits, those are really important. Um, right out of high school, you don't, you don't have to have any particular skills. We always suggest that you're good at math. If you want to start an electrician, it's going to vary from company to company, but probably total compensation is going to be at least 40000 something like that. And a journey of electrician is certainly total compensation is going to be north of $100,000. If you're a supervisor, a foreman, one of those is going to be well north of $100,000 in terms of total compensation. Uh, in terms of benefits, again, that's really important. We have several people on our team, electricians, who have more than a million dollars in their retirement accounts, and they're continuing to pump those up. The average retirement account of the average person, we just went through this on our team, is $89,000 if you're 55 to 64. 89000 bucks. Now, anybody has got that much in their retirement account, you're 60 years old, you're not retiring. So all of our guys look forward to retirement because they got so much money. So don't just focus on wages. Your benefits are really important, especially once you have a family, all the parents know that. And the other thing, too, I would say is um, don't get so caught up in where you start. I'm not doing the exact same thing I did when I started, and probably nobody else in this room who's been working 20 years is doing the same dang on thing they did when they started. So always think about where can I start and what's the opportunities that are ahead of me. And that, that's really the important thing. And the other thing I would add is, okay, um, just remember this. None of us, even though we're all really on the same team here, we're encouraging you to go do something. And Ben, we're, we, we work together all the time. None of us knows what the future holds, right? Things change. But develop your leadership skills. If you're a great leader, then it just doesn't matter. Because no matter what happens in any industry, there's always going to be a shortage of leaders. And if you're good, it doesn't matter whether it's good times in the economy, bad times in the economy. If you're a good leader and you've got a good skill set and you're working at a good company, you're going to have a great job, a great career. So always continue to think about it that way. And I and Phil pointed this out earlier, always continue to learn. I always tell people, get out of four-year apprenticeship school, learning's not over. Keep learning, keep learning.
So we are a signatory company or a union company. Um, we have a five-year apprenticeship program for both our steam fitters and our plumbers. We, um, it's a nationally recognized schooling program that has a, has a structured pay scale every six month raises and all until you turn out. First year apprentice starts somewhere around $22 an hour right now. And my mechanics top out when, as soon as they graduate school, which a lot of these guys, if they get in at 18, 23 years old, you're making hundred K. Our benefits package is, is top notch. I mean, we have, we have free healthcare. We have a great pension program. We have a retirement savings account program. We have a bunch of other programs. All of our schooling is free. So you're making hundred grand a year and zero debt when you graduate. You know, I mean, now it takes a lot of dedication. It's a lot of hard work to go to work, to go to school, to do all of that because it's a competitive program. It's hard to get in. It's hard to stay in. You know, they move people out if, if they're not if they're not keeping up with the program because there's somebody else in line that wants to get in. Um, but like Scott said, with with that being said, leadership is very hard to find. So if you can if you can get better at being a leader, if you can get smarter, if you can keep working more schooling. Because you can always go back to school. You can always go back. I went back and got my master's. I've done a bunch of other things. I've got a lot of certs that a lot of guys don't have because it just makes it that much better. And it makes it that much easier for me to keep a job, to be more valuable to the company I work for, to be more valuable to myself and my family. So. Thank you. Uh, the last question, I ex and I'm expecting probably very similar review, uh, responses, is what is the current need for workers at your company and what do you see as the future of need of workers of these types of your company? We need everything from entry level guys who want to get in and start a great career to, to experienced guys to, um, to leadership to even into the office side. A lot of people that start where I did as a kid at 18 are now the um, men and women running my company. You know, they're project managers, they're estimators. Um, my executive VP is much older than me, and he started off as a steam fitter when he was 18. Um, so there's the potential for growth is is quite amazing in our industry now. You know, it's not just it's not just your your old construction worker carrying his lunchbox to work, and that's all he's going to do for the rest of his life is hammer rivets and stuff. Um, you know, it's a uh, we need we need people in every aspect. CAD programming, like Scott said, you know, we don't we don't build buildings off blueprints anymore. We build buildings off of computer models, and you know, we can, you know, it's gotten to the point now that before we even bring clients in, we put VR goggles on them, and they can literally walk around the buildings that we're constructing while we're constructing them. So anywhere from just a person who wants to get in to get a really good career to to management, we need everything. Our entire industry. Yeah, I agree with, with everything Ben said. That um, on our team specifically, we focus primarily on entry level. We're a developmental organization, so we, we bring people in when they're young and, and develop them up. We have a person on our team who's uh, getting ready to uh, complete his 50th year working for the company, and uh, you know he started when he was uh, 18 years old. Um, but as far as the industry wide, in, in terms of electrical contractors in general, yeah, there's openings all up and down the organizations, whether it's project management. Or electricians, or uh, you know, it's been talked about on the virtual construction side. So there's great opportunities, and again, it's it's where can you go? There, there, there's plenty of runway for anybody who wants to work hard, continue to learn, and uh, develop. So as I mentioned earlier, 25 percent of our workforce is eligible to retire in the next five years. So we definitely have a need for operators and all of the other positions um, that we that we do have. Like the others have said, our positions original, you know, years ago, plants were operated manually, people turning pumps and valves and things. And while there is still some of that, a lot of it now is more technology driven. And a lot of the older workforce is ready to move on because that's not their skill set. So we are looking for, for younger people who do have those skill sets that can move into those positions. Same with us, looking for everybody across the board. And uh, I'll give you a hint. If you show up on time, if you show up every day, bring a good attitude, follow the rules, you'll be successful. That is 90% of the people that don't make it break one of those rules. And mostly it's not showing up or not showing up on time. It's literally that easy. That's what's missing today in most workers is an attitude, showing up, show up on time, follow the rules. I always say that we don't fire people, they shoot themselves in the foot. 
So if you follow those four things, you're going to be successful, and then we're going to do the rest of teaching. My company's a little different. We place our welders and machinists, but I was at a, a tour at a company in Baltimore recently, and the owner of the company looked, looked toward it. People working for me now will be millionaires. And what that means, you, know, you make 100000 a year for 10 years, you have the benefits. He's, he's turned these people into very successful people and he can't find people. He's desperate in need of machinists and welders. That's how bad it is. I, I've been to a technical gathering in Chicago and, and they talked to somebody from General Motors. We offer education starting salary like $45 an hour and we can't get anybody. So I, I love this festival showing people that you can get a really good job without college and you can be created like a machinist or welder. You make things, you're, you're challenged all the time. And it, it's a great, and it, and, we're, and it's not just in manufacturing, I, I think of just men, there's a lot of opportunity for both genders. You know, our welding instructor at our place is female. And we, we place a lot of females in machining and, and black. So. If you're female, CNC machining welding is a great opportunity also. Thank you, Jim. First, I'd like us to give the panelists a round of applause. For so uh, hopefully you have heard about some of the great opportunities, and this is just a small fraction. I mean, I've only, we only had time for five panelists, but I could have brought in a dozen more from IT and cybersecurity and the military. Um, it's just there's so much out there as you heard they need you and you can make a really good living doing this so again I'm so glad you're here um, please share the knowledge you get today from these panelists Dr. McCrary and then what you will see the rest of the day with your friends and family and parents and especially your teachers and counselors because they need to know about it we really like to have more counselors here but unfortunately it's just kind of a trade-off you do it on the weekend you get more students and parents you do it during the week, you get more counselors. So we decided this year to do it on the weekend. And what's gonna happen now, I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie in just a moment. He's gonna tell you about the rest of the day where you'll get to see the facilities here and the great learning and training opportunities they have here at CCDC for some of these and other jobs. So thank you very much for being here. Jamie, you're gonna go through the agenda for this today. Thanks, Bill. And thank you to Dr. Martinez, Dr. McCrary, our panel, uh, for everyone who spoke here today. If you don't have an agenda for today, I do have it up on screen, but it might be hard to see. So we do have extras in the back, and I have a few extras here. So I'll just pass those around to you all uh, so that you all can follow along. So this is the part where you get to leave the room and go see and do, okay? Um, so if you're taking a look at the agenda, you'll see that we have three sessions planned for you. So we're at 10.05 right now, and we have faculty and staff dotted all over this building, the math and science hall, and in our transportation building. Um, and that's going to be where you're going to go for all the different sessions that you want to see. Okay, so the three different sessions are listed at 10 15, 11 15, and 12 15. They're about 45 minutes long. Okay, you can feel free to move in between sessions as well if you, are, if you see something that you're interested in and then you're there for 20 minutes and then you want to jump somewhere else. That's fine too. But we intentionally set up three sessions with lots of different options so you can move around and see things. Uh, but everything is being done three times. Okay, so if you miss one thing in one session, you can always go see it in the next session or in the third session. So I just wanted to point out the mathematics and science hall towards Alan. Is uh, Alan Chin still in the room? Alan's in the back holding his hands. He's going to help me direct people over to the math and science hall. We have a couple of faculty that are going to be doing tours. So if you're interested in seeing, um, stopping in to see the math center, the anatomy and physiology labs, the physical and bio biological labs, the green roof, and the planetarium, and I'll jump down to the bottom, uh, we will have a planetarium show at 1.30 today. So if you want to do the math and science hall tour, that'll at least show you where the planetarium is so that you can go back there at 1.30. So there will be a little, bit, a little bit of a break from 1 to 1.30. You can walk the campus and kind of hang out if you want to stick around for the planetarium show at 1.30. So now if I come back up to the Health Careers and Technology Building, that's the second bullet down. That's the building that we're in right now. And we are in room 205. 
This is the only thing that's going on in this space. So the food will stay up here if you want to pop back up to grab something, but everything else is going to be happening down on the first floor, which is one floor below us, and then the lower level, okay? And so that's where we have everything listed out, our fab lab demonstrations, our machine shop demonstrations, um, and our HVAC demonstrations, uh, and aviation as well. If you want to see some of our simulators and get a tour of the aviation program, that's all going to be on the lower level. That's two floors down. And there will be people floating around helping you, uh, helping to direct you. Um, if you want to see survey technology, uh, we have some equipment set up in the parking lot where you most likely park, lot number five. So Professor Sutherland will be out there and he will have a transit and a tripod and some equipment out there to do some demonstrations through those three sessions. On the first floor, we have our electronics demonstrations in room 130, so that's one floor below where you are now. And then we have in room uh, 101E, we have cybersecurity and digital forensics. And then uh, our CAD program is also going to be doing a demonstration in room 105. Those rooms are all very close together, one floor down. And again, there will be people to help direct you um, in the hallways. Uh, robotics and virtual reality demonstrations will be in room 116. The last thing I wanted to mention to everybody in terms of where things are happening is the transportation building is where you would go to see any automotive uh, um, programming. Okay, so that's a little bit down the hill past our athletic center, and we will have folks directing you from the blue awning right out by lot five, which is where you all came in most likely this morning. Um, the last thing I did want to say is that we have a, a lot of literature in the back. All of our programming across all of our STEM programs, whether that's credit or continuing education, there's a bunch of giveaways on the back table. You're welcome to take those. And I think there's going to be some giveaways dotted around through the different presentations as well. Information on our programs, information um, on scholarships that are available, and, uh, and uh, again, lots of giveaways. And of course, the food will stay up here and available for you to pop back up and grab something. So at this time, we're going to let you guys move over to your first session at 10.15. All the rooms are listed there. There will be help to get you where you want to go. Please enjoy the rest of the day, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you.